G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plug Up Podcast. My name is Cade McDonald and I'm joined by my co-host today, Connor Rogers. Rogie, how are you travelling, mate? Uh, travelling very well considering the conditions our state are forced to endure, but uh, it's hard not to keep the spirits relatively high when there's finals footy on, uh, when the Premier League gives back, Cristiano Ronaldo's headed back to Manchester United. It's all happening in the world of sport and... Um, it is my uh, duty this week to write out the run sheet uh, for today's programming of the Back Pocket Plugger podcast, and I have deliberately waited until last until we speak about the demons, because I reckon if we jump the gun and speak <laughs> about how you're winning the flag, we could spend an hour on it and not have time for anything else. <laughs> yeah, well, I am very excited to dig into some D's chatter. Um it was an amazing performance, if we're going to be honest. But we'll kick things off with the headline. <laughs> a little bit of a controversial headline, and I like it. Really interesting topic, and I can't wait to sink our teeth into this one. But fire us off with the headline, Rogie. Dawson Rog Limited, you open up the front page, and it reads, Time off Toby. I would have thought oh. so. <laughs> I would have thought so. What were you thinking, Toby? We all love you, but what were you thinking, Shagger? There's no real debate here. Um, no. And I'm massive on the Toby tax because I love watching him play. And I'm, uh, you know, I get sucked into the, oh, geez, if it was someone else, would we be talking about it? You know, I do get sucked into that a little bit. I like to defend Toby Green. Very exciting, one of a kind type player. But just straight away with the naked eye, watching him just burst through the umpire's <laughs> chest, <laughs> I was going, well, that's, you, we know that's not on. Like, we all yeah. know that that is not on. And then I was on Twitter, which is sometimes the start of my demise mentally when I go onto that site. <laughs> but I was on Twitter and some people were slowing it down frame by frame and trying to argue that the contact didn't happen. And I was like, watch it in real time. He clearly brushes his shoulder as he sort of aggressively and assertively walks through the umpire in a pretty like the demeanour wasn't very uh, positive. Um, so people were starting to sort of conspiracise that there was no contact. Ludicrous. Um, yeah, very disappointing. And I think I said it was minimum two, maybe three. And then watching all the uh, the shows last night, they were saying four to six and I can see why. Yeah, well, the only reason why it wasn't more extreme contact, like contact that makes you go... Jesus Christ, Toby, that is the biggest brain fade of all time. You're, you spend the season out next season. is because Matty Stevick sort of turned his body. Like, you yeah. saw Toby was about to walk into him, so he, like, opened up his body a fraction, and that made it less of, you know, a hip and shoulder thud to a, a sort of a glancing, glancing shoulder. But still, it was, you know, it wasn't like elbow to the point of the elbow to the point of the elbow. It was like you have lined him up. And uh, walk straight through him. You cannot, you can't touch an umpire. Um, and yeah, the, there were players, Scotty Pendlebury coming out in defence of him. Um, Luke Cara Hodge, Wilson, Luke Hodge, yeah, in the post game presser was very critical of Luke Hodge asking the soft question. Yeah, because um, he didn't say, uh, <laughs> "Toby, you walked into the umpire. Why did you do that?" He went, "Toby, you were." Gonna go walk back into your teammates, and no. you you, ac- you accidentally bumped. Uh, we all know it was an accident, mate. But talk us through what happened. Yeah, <laughs> gave him the uh, biggest out. <laughs> yeah, it, as if Toby was going to go. Actually, uh, Hodgie, it wasn't an accident. Actually, um, no, I was yeah. human. Burst through. No, him. Yeah. <laughs> um, so they've given him a bit of an out, and uh, yeah, I, initially my thoughts were. Uh, three weeks, but I thought if I came out and told me mates in the group chat. Oh, that's three weeks. They'd go, oh, you're, you're a bitch, Rog. Yeah. You know, he, he, didn't fuck, he didn't fucking king hit him. He just, you know, glanced through him. That should be one week max. Hopefully he gets off. Mm. But in my heart, I thought three weeks. And then it started coming out that could be six. And if he got six weeks, I almost wouldn't have an issue with it. Because no. I've watched 22 games, uh, 22 rounds of football a year for 23 years. And I'm yet to see one person ever do anything like that. So yeah. should know better. Every other player knows better. And as we record this podcast now at 9.51 uh, on a Tuesday morning, um, the Toby Green uh, Tribunal is actually in session. So hopefully by the end of the podcast we can uh, discuss the outcome, although by well, the time this yeah, is released, at, everyone at, will already know. Everyone will know, but at the minute he's pleaded not guilty. And I remember... He's on pleaded a- not guilty. He pleaded not guilty. And on AFL 360 last night, 
Uh, Jared Waitley was very certain that he should plead guilty and sort of put your hand up and cop the whack. And if GWS went not guilty, they would try and um, argue over some of the wording. And I think like disrespectful was one of the wording in um, in the ruling. So you could sort of argue what is disrespectful. And not only is, has he pleaded not guilty, Matt Stevick has weighed in. Um, I don't know if this is at the tribunal. I think it is. But he said, I considered the contact minor and did not feel threatened at the time. So Matt Stevick sort of giving him a little bit of a chop out here, but... Um, <laughs> oh. Oh. Right, it's murky waters it because is. because if you give that the green light, if you say, "Oh, that's just a fine," then you know we're allowing sh- you to make shoulder contact with an umpire's midriff. Like you know, we're yeah. allowing that any time you want to walk through an umpire, you can. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that's I understand what Matty Stevick's doing. I reckon if he had have come out and said. Yeah, I did feel disrespected and whatnot. The amount of abuse he would have got from, f- yeah. yep. from the footy community who aren't quite res- understanding of what this situation is, um, yeah, he would have been in would have been in all sorts there. So we'll, hopefully we get the result back. But either way, I think it's fair to say that it's highly unlikely Toby Green plays again this season, even if Giants make it to a grand final. And um, Caro was talking about it costing him the captaincy next year. Do you think that that's a possibility? Well... You don't want your captains, like you'd never see, jeez, I don't know. You, you, you probably wouldn't see a Canelio do that. You wouldn't see a Canelio sort of uh, frustratedly and aggressively uh, put himself in a position like that. So in terms of the captaincy, I don't know because I, I feel like he's made some strong grounds over the last year um, to really put his hand up and be in contention. Like when he took over the captaincy, was it against Geelong or maybe a couple of games this year, he, he acted like a captain, like he loves that club. And even in the post-game press conference, he speaks like a leader. And I think it would be a great evolution for Toby Green to eventually get it. But um, you've got to iron out some of these uh, these frustrated acts that he does before you get a gig at the captaincy, I would have thought. i tell you what, I'm looking forward to the open mic he does when his career is finished. And he <laughs> just, Mike runs through all of his little indiscretions because there have been so many. I can't... The amount... He's had to pay like over $30,000 just in fines, let alone the suspensions <laughs> and whatnot. So um, that's what some people, rookies get paid in a, in a whole year. So, uh, yeah, Toby does need to uh, improve how he conducts himself on field. But uh, enough about that indiscretion. Let's get into the game itself. The Giants v. the Swannies. It was the game of the round, one point in it. And boy, oh boy, were the Giants lucky to hold on. Yeah, well, the one that got away for the Swans. I think I was going to go back and see who we tipped. I think, I think we might have both gone the Giants, or we were definitely leaning yeah. towards the Giants because it was quite funny. Like Sydney all year, I felt were a top four side, and then we go into the elimination final, and I feel like I'm leaning towards tipping the Giants. It was quite bizarre in the lead up, but um, yeah, the Giants were very good. They got out to a bit of a three, four, five goal lead. You just knew. Uh, Sydney were going to try and peg that back, obviously. And they had shot after shot. They had a ridiculous amount of inside 50s, an absurd amount. I think it was like 20 or 25 more than GWS. And, geez, there was some goals at the top of the goal square. Um, Bell had a shot. Um, I can't remember who else had some just... I just knew Bell was missing that shot. I did too. In the group chat, when he was lining up, all of us said, he's missing this. And sure enough, he did. I don't know why, he just... Did not strike me. You know who I didn't think was going to miss was Lance Buddy but, Franklin. The yes. same position of where he kicked it in 2008, lining up, or 2007, um, sorry, for Hawthorne against Adelaide, lining up. Oh, it just spoke of a Buddy Franklin goal. And he missed. He just missed. And it, it's just crazy. They had such a good year, the Swans. They were gr- great performers for the whole season. And now they're just out. Like, it just feels so callous and cold. It's just such a yeah. cold exit. Well, we're waiting for that typical Lance Buddy Franklin uh, reverse swing back through the goals. Yes. When, it was he- when it was heading through the right behind, uh, right behind, I thought, "Yep, just wait, just wait half a second for this to swing back straight <laughs> through the high diddle diddle," and it didn't. Apparently, I can't remember who I was speaking about it, but apparently he doesn't arc around as much anymore, so he doesn't yep. get that 
right to left tail in Morstay's sort of true. So, mm. yeah, it was disappointing. And if he had have kicked that, I think he only needs sort of four more goals to reach the thousand. And the momentum he would have hit, had <sighs> heading into the next game, it would have this, the fairy tale script was written. And then um, the final behind of the game, I believe, went to Justin McInerney, who rolled it through, and it was it was trying its hardest to go in. Trying its hardest, and I thought the Banyol boy is going to get Sydney into the qualifying final, and uh, no, it touched on the line, so it wasn't meant to be. And um, Luke Parker played an absolute ripper. He's out of contract, I believe, and there are whispers of um, of other clubs offering him contracts that Sydney can't keep. And it's Parker's one who it seems like he's thirty two, and you might be able to squeeze a couple more years out of him. I think he's twenty eight yeah. or twenty nine. Yeah. Like, he's still got another good four good years of footy in him. Like, that is more than enough for a premiership tilt. Mm. Well, uh, you, you hear those rumours and there's, like, a Gold Coast Suns that gets spoken about. Now, I know he's not probably in a position where he just goes, finishes off the career. Um, it, you know, he's 31, 32, just, just knocks off a couple of years at the Suns just to get a game. He's still got really good footy left. And I think a Gold Coast Suns need that scalp. We were talking about that sort of... A grader, that 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 leader, that proven AFL footballer to go up there. No more kids need to go up to uh, to Gold Coast. No more um, sort of hacks that are just going up to fill a bit of depth. Um, they they need that proper gun player. And if they could snag a Luke Parker, I think that would be perfect. But um, it's quite funny. Like he's someone. Uh, to, speaking about underrated players. Um, I follow a lot of Swans supporters on, on Twitter and they, they talk about Luke Parker and they talk about his numbers quite often and his numbers are pretty consistently all Australian type numbers but he's just never spoken about and I would never put Luke Parker in the top sort of 10, 15 players just off the top of my head. I don't watch enough Sydney games and I sort of think Luke Parker, like in my head I go, oh yeah, he was gun five years ago but he's been consistent year on year and... um. Yeah, he's still got a lot of good footy left, but I think the Swans have a bit of a squeeze with the cap, so I think there will be either a couple of B-grade names or um, maybe a big name that drop out uh, this this season. Well, if you if Parker were to go to the Gold Coast, all of a sudden you're looking at a midfield of Parker, Miller, Anderson, Rowell, and you're going, that's a bloody A-grade midfield. That could yeah. do anything. So... Yeah. I would love to see that, but something tells me he will stay at Sydney. Mm. Someone that is definitely staying at Sydney, he just screams Sydney, is Isaac Heaney. <laughs> um, do you... Uh, I remember when he burst on the scene, everyone was there saying, this bloke's going to be a top five player. Nothing sure he's going to be a top five, ten player in the league. And he hasn't quite reached that potential. I remember I picked him for years in Supercoach, thinking this is a year he's going to break out and score 150 every match. And he, he's been good without being superstar. But, you know, he, I believe he kicked four goals on the weekend. Do you think he'll become that proper A-plus grader? Or do you think he'll uh, continue just to be, you know, a, a real really good footballer? Well, he's getting towards... I don't know how many goals he kicked this year, but he's getting towards the sort of A-grade forward. Um, he, he consistently... Bob's up with a four or five. And I thought he was going to do the Petrarca. You know, you play forward early on in your career, but in in an instant, they're, they're a midfielder and that's their evolution. And sort of that sort of happened with Cal Mills where he was off the back line and now he's gone in the midfield and they've let uh, Isaac Heaney just play in the forward line and he's starting to develop into that Toby Green type. So maybe his potential is that sort of uh, mid-sized forward. Because he can, he can play tall with the way he can jump at the footy and he can play small, obviously. Um, so I, I could see him just yeah grafting out a bit of a career down forward, being that Toby Green type, kicking those three, four, five, and just being the difference, like winning the game off his own boot with 15 to 20 touches rather than having 30 in the guts. That's becoming one of the most important players on the field is that half forward, you know, maybe 80% forward, 20% mid or 75-25 mm. that can kick your three goals a game and have an impact in the guts. That's probably becoming <laughs> the the most important position in, in the game. That's what I reckon Carlton was hoping Zach Williams would be. I still yeah. hope he will be. But, uh, yes, uh, he will. I think he will become the superstar, Isaac Heaney, and I think next year will be the massive breakout where you see him sort of legitimately be – you know, you, rail, you rack off your top 10 players and Isaac Heaney's in there. Um, uh, what about Jesse Hogan? Former Demon, former Docker. 
Gone across to the Giants and f- I think this was the first game I watched him and I went, this is why he was uh, picked as a rising star. Yeah, yeah. Well, how many did he kick? Was it four? Oh, no, it was two. Two goals, two, but he had his career best in... Big clunks. Yeah, yeah. Career best in contested marks. Um, he He's so handy. He's just such a handy pickup for the Giants. And it was his first ever final. He never played one with the Ds, uh, never played one with the Dockers. So he just came out and played a, a finals-type game. Like, one of those players that stood up. Um, he, I think he missed a couple of easy shots. He could have had three or four, to be honest. But, yeah, he was... Very, very good, Jesse Hogan. It's good to see, and they've given him a one-year contract. One-year? Extension. Is that just an attitude thing? Do you reckon well, like, well, we're not prepared to commit to you for more than one year? Because who knows, you could come back unfit, you could go off the rails? Well, that's that's what I thought. I, I sort of said in my group chat, I'm like, that's a bit stiff. He's played some great footy this year, Jesse Hogan. I think he deserves a little bit of security. And then all my mates said, well, it wasn't that long ago where just... Um, Undisciplined act. Turfed out by Fremantle. After undisciplined act. So let's let's see if he can do it a second year, maybe a third, and then start giving him a a two or three because he'd only be 25, I reckon. 25, 26. So plenty of upside with Jesse Hogan. But um, yeah, a a very, very professional sort of finals performance by the great man. Uh, Well, we will move on to the next game. We were going to talk a little bit about Stephen Keneally and what's happened to him, but I think we've talked enough about the Giants and the Swannies. I reckon we move on to the mob. That is absolutely proving us wrong. Certainly <laughs> silenced me. We labelled them pretenders earlier in the season. And during the season, we were going, we were on to port. We called them pretenders early. We were self-justifying our, our own uh, comments. And here they are, comfortably the second team in the best, second best team in the competition, the power. Absolutely flying the pair. Um, it, is, it is impressive. It's impressive what they're doing. I think they're... Sort of last three or four weeks before the season ended was uh, was convincing, but not convincing enough. Like they sort of got over the line against the Giants and whatnot. I know those games were in uh, Victoria, so they did travel quite a lot to Melbourne, but I still wasn't convinced. And then they sort of limped over the line against a unimpressive Western Bulldogs side, and I thought, oh, geez, well you were getting beaten by five goals most of this game. Not really impressive. And then it just there was two things. I had in my head, I thought the power get up. I didn't think it would be that emphatically, but I thought the power could get up and pinch this or the Cats roll them by 10 goals. Could have gone either way. It didn't go either of those ways, to be honest. The power were the team that got on top and dominated and it just sort of spoke and it just spoke about how important that Max Gorn kick was because it probably would have been a, a real ring-a-ding-dinger if the Ds went over, uh, considering the way that they performed on the Saturday night. But... Uh, I I think you'd still rather finish on top and play the Lions given how the games unfolded over the weekend. So that Max Gorn kick uh, is just massive and telling um, for now, even though the Cats are, are still alive and still in it. They, you just can't put a line through them, but if they show up again the way they showed up on Friday night, it is not going to be pretty. And just quickly, what what is happening? It is now a substantial body of work. They finished top four. And that is so impressive. I am very envious of the sustained success for the Cats. I have so much respect for their success. And I don't think anyone could take that away from them. But we, we've got to stop saying it's, as the, the guys on the couch say, we've got to stop giving them a mulligan in the first week of finals. Why can't they not consistently rock up in that first week of finals? I just, I can't wrap my head around it. We, we thought it was the bye a couple of years ago because... They're notoriously a little bit sluggish off the buy. Well, there was no buy this year, um, and they were campaigning for a buy this year. They they rocked up to Adelaide Oval and just looked like uh, it. Lo- they looked like how I thought Port would play. <laughs> they looked like a fifth to sixth team when two weeks ago, when they were half time up against the D's, I thought they were the number one seed. So question marks everywhere, Rod- Roggy. Well, I think there has to be – it can't be a coincidence. You know, you make the top four – I know in his first season, Chris Scott won the grand final. Um, but since then, they haven't won the big dance and um, they've made the top four just about every year. Mm. Well, that's what it feels like anyway. Can't be – and they've lost all these first finals. It cannot be a coincidence. I don't think it's as simple as the other team just pulls one out of the hat every single time they make a first final. Um, it seems like it has to be a game plan thing. So I think, um, you know, you saw Melbourne when they, uh, the way they played on the weekend, 
it was just, it was a little bit, it, this is how I interpreted it, it was a little bit different to how you play during the season. I thought you were more inclined to surge, you know, surge mm. the ball forward at all costs. And I think that's what finals footy is about because the pressure is up. You can't, there is no... Uh, uh, yeah, there is no way around that. Everyone knows that in finals, everyone finds that ten to twenty percent uh, higher work rate, and you have less time. So, considering you have less time to make decisions, you got to pump that ball forward and surge it forward. It still feels like Geelong aren't willing to play that surge brand of football, and they still want to rely on their kick mark, kick mark. Mm. And I just don't think it works in finals footy because you don't have the time. To do that, you need to be prepared to play that quick surge football and take a bit of a gamble. Yeah, well, when it's not perfect, they just get um, chewed up on the like going going back the other way. Like if they can't get that kick mark going and they do panic and sort of throw it on the boot, oh god, the power just preyed on them. Um, we we often speak about the loser, but uh, Port Adelaide were so so impressive, and the amount of messages I got saying oh, I saw some people screen grabbing some of the opinions from round eleven. <laughs> oh, a Port Adelaide, you know, pretenders now, and I said no last week. I said I've changed my mind. Like, <laughs> yeah. like yes, they are absolutely in the box seat to to get the home final. Once they beat the Bulldogs and finish second, my mind shifts changed completely i was like well hang on they are now probably as good as anyone plays considering the home games um very very impressive alir alir he just yeah. took the p155 just floating around doing what he does best a lot of talk during the week was sort of how middle of the year i'm pretty sure jeremy cameron kicked five or uh, i think the uh the, the three-headed monster had a bit of a day out on the power uh, middle of the year, and that's when you know you saw all the uh, the Instagram graphics of uh, uh, Gary Rowan, Jeremy Cameron, Hawkins on the the dragons' heads, and oh, the cats were absolutely loving it. And there was a little bit of me that thought, oh, geez, you know, Alirali is good, but how is he going to uh, slay the monster? But boy, did he slay the monster! He didn't play on either of them. I don't think he played on any of them. I think he lined up on like a Grian Myers type, <laughs> and then just well, played off. Going into the game, I, I was, and I still am to a degree, very salty that Wiedering was not All-Australian. Twice in a row now <laughs> he's been snubbed of All-Australian. And I thought, I am more than happy for Stephen May to be in there. I'm more than happy for Jake Lever to be in there. Lever's in there, isn't he? Yep. Yeah, more than happy for May, more than happy for Lever. And then I saw a Lear and I went, don't get me wrong, fantastic season. But, you know, we're going into a game next week against Planet Mars <laughs> and um, they've got a ripping 22. Are you selecting Jacob Wiedering or are you selecting Alir Alir? And my gut told me you're selecting Jacob Wiedering if, if the, the, the livelihood of planet Earth depend on it. But um, uh, after watching that game, I've left going, probably a fair call. Alir Alir, is a, super <laughs> st- Alir Alir is a superstar. And, you know, I'm not saying it's definitive that he 100% deserves a spot over Wiedering. I'm just saying I can understand <laughs> the argument if you were to have the opinion that maybe he is had a better season than Jacob Wiedering. Um, how was the small? So obviously Georgie Artis has done a hammy. I don't think it's a big hammy. I think it's a um, – well, it's a big hammy. He's a big boy. But I don't think it's a <laughs> long-term hammy. I think it's only like a little bit of a, a, little bit of a tweak. Um, he yeah. should be back for the prelim. But they look so dynamic with all the smalls. I don't think I've seen Fantasia, Butters, Dersma, Rosie all running around in the same side for a long time. And Fantasia just lit the game up. Yeah, especially um, against if they're going to be coming up against the D's in a granny um, with Big May and Big Lever running the show back there. Uh, you got to think that maybe the small forwards are the better better option than having a Mitch Georgiatis play on a Jake Lever. You know, that maybe could cause you more headaches. But at the same time, I think Georgiatis has kicked 30-plus goals this season, I'm pretty sure, yep. and has played every game that is fit, I believe. So mm-hmm. I don't know if you can tell a bloke, hey, mate, we know you've played every <laughs> game and have been crucial to us finishing in the, in the top four. Um, and you've kicked over 30 goals, so you've absolutely done your job as a 19-year-old. But because Fantasia played well last week, we're running, we're going with him for the rest of the finals campaign. Mm. It, it is a really tough call, but yeah, I'm of, I'm more of the opinion that Georgie Artis, the whole season has gotten them. Did they finish second? Yep. 
Mitch Georgiatis, the whole season, has gotten Port Adelaide to second, been a vital cog, and Fantasia played well, or whoever the small forward is that would have to make way. You know, they've gelled well for one game, and it was a great game. You know, they absolutely fucking smashed the Cats, but um, I think you got to go with the method that got you to second spot on the ladder. Ollie Wines was very good again, and Charlie Dixon, Charlie Dixon is threatening to rip a game apart, but... He, he can go sort of missing. I think I like having a, a Mitch Georgiatis um, in the side because I think he's almost more consistent. Like, he, he, you know what you're going to get from Mitch Georgiatis and it, he's going to compete. So does Charlie Dixon, but he'll kick sort of your one or two. But Charlie Dixon could kick six or he could kick zero. So that's a bit of a tough one in its own. Well, friend of the show who's been very keen for a call out on the Back Pocket Plugger podcast, uh, Aaron Colpin from work. As... Uh, as I reckons uh, Charlie Dixon is the most overrated player in the game. Yeah, I think that's a bit harsh. I can see why that would be said because every game that you tune in for Port Adelaide, all you're thinking about is Charlie Dixon and like, oh, how's this team going to stop Charlie Dixon? And I don't know whether some defences just have this cheat code and they know how to play him or whether he picks and chooses when he rocks up. Is he like the absolute professional upon professional who's – in it every week. I'm not really sure, to be honest. Um, and, and he's better than not. Like, he's he's very, very handy, Charlie Dixon. But sometimes he can go missing a little bit. I just think Georgie Artis is someone who consistently rocks up for the bare minimum, at least. Yeah. Uh, Port Adelaide, the side that you are most afraid of come grand final day? Um. Or, or no, sorry. Or I should say the side you're most afraid of uh, for the final series because you could be playing Geelong in the prelim. Are you more afraid of Geelong in a prelim or say Port in a grand final? <laughs> for the sake of copying it more when we get rolled by either side, but I'm probably more afraid of Geelong in a prelim. I'm probably more afraid of the doggies again. Like if the doggies somehow do it the hard way and get through. Um, the doggies in a grand final are a little bit worrying. Weirdly, I don't. I don't. <laughs> the, know. Port, the port supporters will oh, be no. ripping their hair out. We've written them off all season. They've come out. They've they've managed to finish second after we've labelled them pretenders. They've come out in the first final and absolutely <laughs> pulled Geelong's <laughs> pants down. And where they're going, I think I'd be more afraid of playing Geelong in a prelim than Port in a grand final. That's. I'd just be more afraid of Bulldogs <laughs> who didn't make the four. That's just my mental bias. I think maybe the experts would say, yeah, the power are the team, if not the number one seed the way they're playing at the moment. They are a very good football side. I don't know why. I don't know whether I feel like we uh, match up with them better or um, maybe it's still that that full body of work, that season that I saw and the games that I saw them drop. Maybe that's still what's in my head. But for some reason, like, yeah, well, we played the Dogs uh, a few weeks ago and got beaten by 20 points. And then I think about what, how we played Port Adelaide and we played them quite well. So um, maybe that's just me uh, from a Melbourne point of view thinking of it. But yeah, that does come across a bit. I apologise, Port fans. I do rate <laughs> you and I, I, do, I really don't want to verse you. But um, yeah, there's a couple of sides I'd rather verse at the minute. Moving on now to possibly the game that gave me the most joy out of the round. And um, I have no shame in saying that uh, Essendon, uh, <laughs> the bane of my existence, they rubbed me the wrong way. And it pleased me to see the dogs absolutely cream them for a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, it extended the, the drought. How many days are we on now? Is it 6,000 or are we up to 25,000? 6,206, I believe. 6,206. And hey, look, we've applauded Essendon all season. We've said how impressive they've been when they've run, when you tipped them to win the wooden spoon. Yeah. Um, and they've come out, made finals. Um, but I said to everyone that this is the biggest trap. There were people in my tipping, um, and it's really tight. There's about five people up the top who are separated by two tips. And a bunch of them tipped Essendon, and I said, it's the biggest trap. They've just snuck into the eight, and the Dogs were the premiership favourites a month ago. How on earth could you think Essendon's going to win? And sure enough, the Dogs came out and uh, absolutely creamed them. But there was a bit of uh, controversy throughout the game, Dossie. Uh, do you think the controversy was justified, or do you think it was a bit over the top? Um, <clears throat> tough one. Because heat of the moment, elimination final. Say I'm watching a Lockie Hunter type <laughs> grab three or four goals from three or four decisions, I would be irate. I would be... I, I, would I be, cannot 
cop Lockie Hunter. I don't know why. I really yeah no lo- it's something lo- about him. Yeah, it's Lockie Hunter in particular. He loves that fake push in the back, and he loves yeah. the. He's getting more subtle with the um, the arm raise, which uh, initiates the high contact. But say Lockie Hunter did that, I would be absolutely seething. Uh, so I do understand that frustration of like yelling at your TV. What the hell? But Cody Waitman. Um, I was so impressed by him. I, I love the way he goes about it. I, I, I'm not a fan of that high tackle. He got one of yeah. them. Yeah. One of them was that high tackle. So I think it was early in the game. Um, I think it was a Stewart type. Um, got, got him with the high and he sort of, he, he worked his body to get that free kick. That was there though. You got to pay that. I think it was two meter Peter. Um, oh, it might've been two oh. meter Peter, but then, then there was another one which was directly in front where Draper sort of... Or it was Draper. Uh, Draper flaps his wing and sort of... I reckon Draper was trying to clip him, just subtly clip him. It might have yeah. been an accident, but it looked like Draper sort of flaps his, his, his big wings and clips him with, like, the underarm, and it just knocks uh, Cody Waitman in the head. And that's probably there as well. So that was, that was two frees from two free kicks. I think the one maybe in the third, where he's getting held by Gleeson and he's sort of trying to mark going backwards. I think with the naked eye, that's probably there. And I don't think... I thought it was a free kick live. You can slow down the replay as much as you want, but live in the moment, I thought it was a free kick. And I don't think he was playing for that one. I don't think he was playing for that one. He or was the, just trying to take a mark. Yeah, I don't think he was playing for that one or the Draper one, where he got sort of cl- clipped across the head. And then he was just going for the ball and got... Sent for six over the line, and I don't think that was a free. But I've seen them before, where like someone bumps someone across the line, sort of late, unnecessary. I've seen those paid before. I don't think that should have been paid, but I have seen those paid before. He goes back, slots it. He's loving well, life. Yeah. Don't check so, Insta. <laughs> yeah, so it wasn't like it wasn't an instance where you've seen Joel Selwood eighteen times in a game raise the arm. You know, it wasn't like you saw him dive for free kicks and it's like, oh my god, he's done it again. He was just at the right place at the right time, and the umpire paid the free kick. Mm. And in typical Essendon uh, fashion, in typical uh, Essendon feral fashion. They've jumped on his Instagram. All mm. he's done is kick four ripping goals. They've jumped on his Instagram, absolutely abused the fuck out of him. And uh, uh, there'll be people out there that say, you know, it's just uh, just a bit of banter and whatnot. But for mine, it is just not a great look. I don't like it when you have, uh, what is he, 19 years old, kicking four goals, probably the best day of his life so far. Yeah. Put on an absolute performance and everyone's just on his Instagram calling him all sorts of names and trying to bring him down. It's just horrible, horrible behaviour. I don't think that needs to be a part of football. Call me soft all you like. But uh, No, 100%. It it shouldn't be a part of football. So I I do agree um, with the Essendon fans in terms of if you saw my living room and I was an Essendon fan that game, I would be yelling like, what? What are you talking about, umpire? Like I I would be so frustrated in the moment. Umpire, please like give us a chop out. But I don't think I would be going, we've been absolutely cheated. I would have been like, this is just not our day. Like, oh, he's got another one, Waitman. Bloody Waitman, he's got another one. I don't think I would have been like, the, the AFL mention, has <laughs> cheated us out of the game. Not to mention, they did not kick a goal in the second half. If you had have lost by uh, four points and Cody Waitman's got four goals from free kicks and you reckon a couple of them were contentious then I still wouldn't be jumping on his Instagram and telling him <coughs> to die. But, I, you know, I, I can understand your frustration. But when you have not kicked a goal in the second half, that has nothing to do with Waitman's free kicks. It has to do with the fact that you're not quite good enough yet to play finals footy. Mm. Next year, probably you will improve and you probably will win that el- elusive first final in 6,000 days. But Well, yeah, my, just, my, my first thought was put an Essendon jumper on him. You'd love yeah. him. How much 100%. would you love him? 19-year-old kid, he flies for hangers, he kicks goals out of his behind. His smothering, bit bit. smothering and tackling pressure is first class. Like, I think if he had an Eston jumper on and, and you're walking away from that game, the exact same game, you'd go, how bloody lively was Waitman? My favourite bit about Waitman that I wish I had someone on the Carlton outfit that does the same thing is one of his mates will lay a tackle and lock the ball inside their 50. And he celebrates as if they've just kicked the match winner. And he's, he's like... Yeah, his energy. It's, 
genuinely stoked for his teammate that he's helped, that <clears> the teammate has helped the team do something positive for the match. Something as simple as locking the ball inside 50. And if everyone had that energy, that is that stuff wins premierships, you know what I mean? That's what gets yeah. the team up and about. I couldn't be a bigger fan of Cody Waitman. And, um, yeah, the, the abuse didn't stop at Cody Waitman. This is when it got... Really, really poor from uh, the Essendon tragics. Um, and once again, obviously, this isn't all Essendon fans. The majority, uh, like you and I, good supporters. But mm. it's just their ferals that always happen to take it a bit further than other clubs' ferals. And um, they've jumped on and they've racially abused their own superstar, Anthony McDonald, Tip and Woody, for uh, for not playing that game. Well, um, yeah, th- th- this is <clears throat> one dickhead, obviously, and I think. There's, so sometimes when stuff like this comes out about Essendon, you see so many supporters say they try and distance them, themselves from that incident. And yeah, I, so uh, it's almost a little bit stiff to call this bloke an Essendon fan. Now, um, the club came out and made a statement about the Waitman abuse and um, obviously the Tip and Woody uh, comment as well. So uh, like, if I was there and I was an Essendon supporter, I'd be – in the Facebooks and comments, because you see it all the time, you know, this doesn't represent everyone. And and a part of me goes, well, I know it doesn't, but it is a, a, another incident from Essendon. But I can 100% um, sympathise and empathise with those supporters who aren't like this and they just don't want to be connected to this at all. With the tipper uh, racial abuse, of course, I don't think that um, the majority of fans are like that, or even even a minority of you know, it is a tiny amount that would be like that. Yeah. But um, when Brent Stanton gets uh, concussed and subbed out, and the whole crowd cheers him off for getting concussed, um, I think there is a problem with the Essendon fans. If I'm being <laughs> honest, you know, do I think they're all of racially abusing tipper? Of course not. But is there a cultural culture problem at that fan base? 100% there is. That mm. was a whole stadium Bill and Stanton off. So, in my opinion, I think uh, uh, you need to have a chat to your Essendon supporter next year. I, I know you have friends and I have friends that are Essendon supporters who don't like going to Essendon games because sitting amongst the Essendon faithful can be quite frustrating. And I certainly don't like sitting in amongst them. Um, and that's just my opinion. Maybe they're not as bad. Maybe I just have grown up with a personal well, there's bias just to been, hate them. Yeah, there's just been a... <laughs> sort of uh, very niche body of work from like the, the sort of PR around the Essendon faithful over the last 10 years has been really, really quite odd. Like incident after incident that you go, Oh, that's a bit odd. Did, did that, there is, did, did that really happen? Up to, there's about 10 articles that I could find <laughs> online right now where it's specific to Essendon and it's, yeah, it, eyebrow raising. But we should move on. Enough about some of the negative stuff. Uh, let's talk about the D's v. the Lions. We've held off to talk about it. Uh, this could be our first ever hour-long podcast because I want you to <laughs> tell me how the D's are winning the premiership this year and how they may as well already <laughs> engrave the cup because you are home. <laughs> oh, no. I'm touching that many items of wood in my room. It is. <laughs> Not funny, um, not through excitement, but through just the uh, super <laughs> the superstition. Um, geez, don't say that. That's that's that. Don't jinx us. Don't jinx us. Um, look, what a performance! It's the performance that oh, I was hoping we would produce. And some of my mates are getting sick of me. Dutch was telling me to shut up midway through the game because after the first term, we leaked four really easy goals, and I went glass half empty. I'm going. Charlie Cameron's kicked three. Goal, ground ball, inside 50 goals out the back of the pack. We don't leak four goals in a quarter. If it's going to be a shootout, well, you know, I was just stressing. And Dutch goes, shut up, you're 30 points up at half time. And I'm like, yeah, but we're not home yet. They kick one you, in the third. You messaged me <laughs> as well. And I, 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 I think I, I gave you a courtesy. I gave you a bit of a, yeah, Dave's looking good here or something like that. <laughs> and, you, and you've gone, oh, geez, it's not looking great. You know, we've, we never leak four goals in a row. And I'm sitting there and I started questioning myself. I was going, maybe I've been a bit biased towards the D's because I've got a bit of money on them to win the flag. I don't know what it is. Is, but maybe you are right and they haven't been that impressive. So I went along with it with you and I went, oh, yeah, but, you know, still positive that you haven't had the best half and you've, you're have you still up. In my head, I'm thinking you've played a fantastic half. You're playing like premiers. Uh, yeah, and on reflection, like all the, the media and how everyone sort of responded to the game, everyone was like, that was just one of the great <laughs> qualifying final performances, like just a really solid performance. I don't know. I don't know. That whole game I was just watching going, geez, 
we're going to find a way to lose this. We're going to lose this. I was, I, I didn't enjoy the game watching. I was sitting there stressed. My heart was pounding the whole match. Like I thought it would settle 30 points up at half time, but I felt sick. Um, on reflection, great performance. <laughs> really, really solid performance. Um, I, I just, they're building towards something in terms of putting it all together. Now, Sort of went missing in the third there because uh, the Lions fought back and they fought back hard. Um, we had another 30 scoring shots. We had another 60 inside 50s or something. We could have won that by 60, 70 points and we're just not putting that together. I'm hoping that over the next one or possibly two games, we can have that performance where the scoring shots and inside 50s reflect on the scoreboard because we haven't done that yet. But once again, the highest scoring um, team in the league, we kept them to about 50 or 60 points and we've put on 90 ourselves. Um, The question marks about the forward line is just getting evaporated because I can't believe that I'm sitting here going, geez, that forward line with Fritsch. Tom McDonald and Ben Brown is playing some good premier premiership type football. Like if you if you told me that twelve months ago, I would have said you're kidding yourself. I think the only reason why there were ever question marks over your forward line was because of how elite your midfield and your back line was. <laughs> yeah. I feel like if Ben Brown, um, Tom McDonald and <laughs> Bailey Fritch were the forward line of Carlton or was the forward line of any side outside of the bottom eight, they wouldn't be saying, geez, this forward line's a bit shaky. <laughs> it's only in comparison to the rest of your team um, that because they're not the Petrarca and Oliver and the, and the, and the Leavers and the Gorns and the Stephen Mays. Mm. But... It's um, it's a handy forward line. It's it's by <laughs> it's by no means a uh, 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 Josh Shackey and if I, I know they have Aaron Norton who's a star, but it's not a mediocre forward line. It's a good forward line. I think the way it plays is a good forward line, but I just still think on paper, if someone's super coach had like a fridge, <laughs> Tom McDonald or Ben Brown, I think just on paper those three names doesn't quite scream, you know, premiership favourites, but that. They are humming. They are back to humming at the moment. Um, they played really, really well. And I think our 15 to 22 are potentially the most consistent 15 to 22 in the league. And I think they're the reason we're going a long way this season. Like a Bowie, a Rivers, a Spargo, a Neil Bullen, um, you know, all those names. I think our, our bottom five to six are the reason – we're playing this way because if they don't turn up and they don't um, participate and be that cog in the big machine, then I, I think your Petrarchas and that have too much weight to carry. And I, I sort of compare that to a Geelong. I respect Geelong so much and the way they go about it. Um, I think they're sort of um, one to eight players carry too much of a burden. And if they're not quite on, the team success can waver. I think... Yeah, I think the system is just working so well and I'm so nervous for a prelim. Prelims are so hard to win. Um, These fans know that more than anyone that, you know, a prelim, (laughs) you're guaranteed nothing and it's a very unforgiving sport, this. So I'm going in with all expectations that anything can happen. But I think if they turn up with the attitude and the way they played uh, on Saturday night, then anything can happen and, oh, we're just getting closer and closer to... Something very, very special. So, what a ride. Well, when I think of the great teams, your Hawthorns, your Richmonds, your Brisbane's, you look at the star power and you reel off names and it's, my God, Cox, Judd, Cousins, Kerr. And, uh, you know, you look at Brisbane and it's just Brownlow medalists everywhere. It's just Voss, Ackermanis, Black. And I look at the Demons, um, and, and when you look at the ti- Tigers, their big five of Martin, Cochin, uh, Rance, uh, help me out here, Jack Rewalt, Tom, you know, all these superstars, mm. um, it's just you need that big five star power. And I look at the Demons, Gorn, Oliver, Petrarca, May, Lever, you've just got superstars everywhere. And... When I was watching that game and I was watching Clayton Oliver, oh, that, was the f- <laughs> that was the first time where I went, I feel like I'm watching the best player in the game when I'm watching Oliver. You know, there have been times during the season where I'm watching Bontempelli in full swing and I go, yeah, this is, I feel like I'm watching the best player in the game. And we've talked about this before. For some reason, when you ask someone, um, maybe before this season, you ask someone, Who's the best midfielders in the league? They'll go, oh, yeah, Martin, 
uh, Fife, et cetera. And Clayton Oliver isn't in that first five players you name or maybe, maybe mm. even ten. But now you have someone who's a premier midfield in the competition. You're pretty much going Oliver than Bontempelli, I think. Yeah. Well, he's taken his game to a new level. And it's just crazy because he, he burst onto the scene in the AFL, averaging 27, 28 touches a game. He probably should have been All-Australian in his second year. Um, they didn't give it to him, but he averaged 28 touches that whole season as a 19-year-old. And from then, he, he's done that. But he was, he was almost picked the ball up and then clean handball out of the stoppage. But that was his first go. And his first one or two steps, it's a quick handball out. And people said, all he does is handball. And I'm going, well, you know, I've seen Brent Maloney handball out of stoppages, but this is a little bit different. The way this bloke can assess the options and hit the target and help us work out of a stoppage is very impressive for a 19-year-old. And then then he copped the, you can't kick. So he started to kick and he would butcher some of the footy. Now, some of his kicking has been amazing, but some of his kicking has been really, really bad, just lazy off a of one step. Um, he's worked on it, worked on it, worked on it. And then some of the um, the conversations I've heard the Melbourne Footy Club talk about, especially Petrarca and Oliver over the last year, is how their first 10 to 15 steps out of a stoppage is really important. And I, I th- this might be something that all midfielders do, and maybe the Ds are really late to it, but I don't think it is. Watch Petrarca and Oliver's first 15 steps. It's like NFL um, sort of uh, really light on their toes, sort of Fred Flintstones. That Their legs just go absolutely ham for the first 10 steps and it either gives them time to brace for a tackle and handball or work out of the stoppage. Now, if you watch Clayton Oliver now, his first 10 steps are very light, very quick and he's giving himself the chance to instead of just handballing instinctively first, he's giving himself to sort of float like a butterfly out of the bloody stoppage and then use his feet. Um, and, well, wow, just the way he was kicking on the weekend was something to behold. And um, he's finally... We're, we're seeing like an almost fully formed version of him and it's it's getting scary. He, he's, he's just so good. And I was just so impressed. Like him and Petrarca are made for finals footy and the way they went about it was just was was uh, was a lister it was like hollywood it was like movie star rock up with the sunnies get the job done no photos on to the next job like it was they, they all follow the nba and they all love um yeah basketball and i think petrarca and oliver have that nba quality that roll into the locker room with the suit on and the sunnies come out perform you know it, 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 they, they love the pressure they love the limelight they love yeah, they just love it. So it's just amazing because for many years, your Rowan Bales and your Michael Evans, they, they, they didn't play like this. So I'm just very fortunate to be able to watch genuine quality Rowan footballers. <laughs> That's a name I haven't heard of for a while. Yeah, no, uh, you are the firm premiership favourites and um, you get through the prelim and then um, I th- I'm a lot more worried about the prelim for you than I am the grand final. I think if you make the grand final, um, it really, truly is yours to lose. I just think your game plan holds up on grand final day. But I think that desperation of a prelim final, um, if it's up against the Cats, um, I'll be weirdly nervous for some reason I can't explain. <laughs> but let's have our... Um, give me your tip. We are starting to run out of time a bit. So just give me a tip for the Cats v the Giants. Oh, I reckon this is going to be an arm wrestle. I, I reckon the Giants, even though they're undermanned, I reckon they'll come out and push the Cats to the end. But I'm going to say the Cats by 10 points. Yeah, I'm going to go with the Cats by uh, probably about three goals. I think it'll be an arm wrestle when they blow out in the last quarter with uh, the Giants without Toby Green. Uh, I think it's going to be a bit too hard for him. And then uh, the other... The other final we have on our hands this weekend is the Lions and the Bulldogs. This one, I reckon, will oh, divide God. a few people. <laughs> yeah, geez, this is one for your tipping comp, Rog. This is um, this is a tough one. Lions and Lions and the Dogs. I, I, I get the feeling the Dogs get it done. I have a great feeling the Dogs get it done. But a wise man once told me never fall <laughs> into the trap in finals of tipping um, the, the team. The, bot- the winner <laughs> over the team that has played well all season and played well enough to make the top four. So the Gabba too. Yeah, so I'm going to be tipping um, in my competition where I'm actually level with one other person in the lead and there's, you know, hundreds of dollars on the line here. I'll be, <laughs> I'll be heeding that wise man's advice and tipping the Lions, but in my heart of hearts, gun to my head, I feel the doggies are just that be- a better side. But 
Yep. We'll, uh, we'll wait and see. Now time for everyone's favourite segment, <laughs> the G's, the B's and the O's. Our goals behinds out in the fools. Caden McDonald, YouTube phenomenon. Fire us away with your out in the full. Uh, my out on the full, Roggie, is uh, a little bit of media trickery, which they love to do. Um, our man, Ed Langdon, over the weekend was getting interviewed by a Adelaide radio station after the game and he was asked about Simon Goodwin and how he's been for the group. And he goes, geez, I, I love playing under Goody. He's cool. He's calm. I don't think I've heard him raise his voice, you know, coming from uh, coming from Freo with Ross, you know, you couldn't walk into a, a meeting and look him in the eyes sort of stuff. Um, so, yeah, I, I really love Goody. And then the first question straight away was, oh, so Ross yells a bit, does he? And he goes, ah, just a little bit. I felt like it was all tongue-in-cheek, but the context was taken out of it. The screen grab looked great on all sort of uh, publications, uh, Facebook pages and social medias, and Ed Langdon copped an absolute barreling for a couple of days. Uh, there was Carlton Faithful coming out and absolutely uh, tearing him to shreds, saying, well, you know, I think this says a bit about you, Ed Langdon, you're softy. Uh, I didn't see many Freo supporters or Freo people come out and be... Um, upset, and then the next day, Ed Langdon calls Ross Lyon and goes, "Look, mate, that's yeah, that's really not how I meant it." They all put it to bed, um, and they called it backpedaling. So I just felt like the clickbaity uh, culture that we have, where you can grab a a a sentence out of context, you know how much this is going to get comments and clicks and debate. And then um, you can run with it as much as you like. And then, I don't know, to call the next day Ed Langdon, who who, who apologised for all the riffraff that he caused, to call that backpedalling, I don't even think his initial stance was how it was taken. So pad- it wasn't a front pedal in the first place. <laughs> he's, not, he's not even on a bike. He's just walking. So it was just your, your typical media just... As you said, profit over people. <laughs> profit over people, a capitalist society. We need to get rid of it. Uh, we're due for a revolution. It's been a couple hundred years. Uh, my, <laughs> out in the f- my out in the fall is the Geelong Cats. Uh, now, going into this uh, tipping round, um, I, w- I was level. I was. And I thought... Gee, if ever if there was an upset this week, I think it's going to be Geelong. We label Port pretenders. Mm. I thought they have the class in their side. They have Dangerfield, Selwood, Duncan, Guthrie getting it out of the guts. To Jeremy Cameron, Tom Hawkins, Gary Rowan up forward. You've got to be kidding me. Blitz has, you know, they've got quality players down back as well. And I thought, this is a quality team that sh- surely this is where they stand up and they win that first final. They've made the top four. Um, they are a quality outfit. Chris Scott... Get, get rid of all the media that are on your hammer for not being a finals outfit. Prove them wrong. And they couldn't get it done. And it's not wasn't even a close game. They got belted. Um, so Geelong am I out in the full. And uh, he's hoping that they do win this weekend for Chris Scott because I feel <laughs> like he... I feel like with the amount of times he's got them in the top four, he doesn't deserve to be under this much pressure. No. But, but um, that's what comes with losing... Key, key games and key finals. Yeah, geez, if he's under pressure and he's getting scrutinised, um, tough caper because he's yeah, been exactly right. <laughs> as successful as anyone. I'm going to move on to the behinds, and my behinds is for Nick Hines. Uh, Nick Hines, you poor bastard. Uh, ah. we, we all know in the AFL bubble, uh, their restrictions are stricter than the public's, and he probably shouldn't have gone to a supermarket, but to duck in, get a takeaway salad and duck out in there for two minutes max and find tested yourself... Tested negative. He's tested negative. <laughs> find he yourself hasn't at, got a, COVID. <laughs> at a tier two site, not be allowed into Tasmania for an elimination final. I just think, don't have to be dead to be stiff. But I think also... Um, Congratulations for sort of doing the right thing. I do like the QR coding. I do like he's done the right thing by the public. Um, I just think just super stiff, super stiff for Nick Hind. Um, and, yeah, it's a behind because I think he could have been very handy on that Sunday afternoon elimination final. Yeah, it is. You'd be that tempted as a player to not check in and go this way. Um, I can play no matter what. But yep. imagine if you didn't check in. It turns out you go to Tassie. It was COVID in there. You go to Tassie. You oh. give it to the league, and you've literally cost the league a final series. Uh, probably the right call to check in. So good on you, Nick Hind. Yep. Um, my behind is the Perth. Uh, Perth being locked in for the grand final. 
Of course, Optus Stadium is the best stadium in the league, apart from the MCG, although I do love Adelaide Oval. Um, but I just really dislike Mark McGowan and the way he goes about <laughs> his business. He is arrogant. He did not. He wasn't excited in the slightest to have the grand final uh, in Perth. He was smug. And, um, you know, I, I'm worried because... They lock down faster than any city locked down, even faster than mm. Dan Andrews down in Melbourne. All it'll take is the day before or the day of the grand final, one case to pop up, bang, we're locked down. No one's going to the uh, Optus Stadium for the grand final. I don't know what they'd do. I don't think they'd play in front of an empty stadium. I think they'd consider postponing it a week or something. I'm sure they'd no. have some contingency plan. But... Um, yeah, I don't think you could play a grand final in, pr- in front of an empty stadium, put it that way. I think that it's a lot better to wait a week um, and have it in front of a packed crowd. But They did it for the yeah. Derby, uh, middle of the year. Uh, I think it was the Derby. Or maybe it was Frio Western I Bulldogs. think it was the Derby. Oh, well, yeah, the Derby. Well, the, uh, people were going to the game. People were rocking up to the game and they got told at 10 o'clock when the game kicked off at 2 or 3 or something um, that to go home, but, you know, we're going into lockdown. Uh, there has to be some sort of guarantee that that can't happen. Like, if there's one case, it's I know we don't want COVID running rampant in WA, but if it's one case and it pops up at 10 o'clock in the morning, the day of the grand final, surely get the grand final done, all the festivities, and set up a lockdown, you know. for Well, even one case, but oh, yeah, it's a tough one. I just think you can't be that hard, and there's got to almost be a guarantee that that won't happen. Absolutely. What's your goal, mate? My goal, Zachy Butters. Uh, oh, one of one of my favourites. Awesome. One of my favourites, Zachy Butters. Um, I saw a very good contest between him and Jeremy Cameron on the weekend. Uh, Jeremy Cameron, it was sort of maybe third or fourth quarter. Um, he 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 picked up the ball inside fifty. There was one way to get to goal and it was by going through Zach Butters. And instead of sidestepping him or trying to shrug him off, he just thought. Gee, Zach Butters looks like a very small human. I'm going to charge through you. Tried his best, but couldn't. Zach Butters against Jeremy Cameron. Grabbed him, uh, tackled him, sort of bounced off a little bit, then grabbed his jumper, pulled him down. Just summed up the Port Adelaide Footy Club for the night. And, um, yeah, he's a tough, tough individual, Zach Butters. I'd be second-guessing charging through him as well. Now, Rog, what's your goals to finish us off for the Back Pocket Plugger podcast? Uh, my goal is Benny Brown. He's uh, been turfed out from the Wooden Spooners. He's been told we don't need you. So he's jumped across from the north of Melbourne to inner Melbourne <laughs> and he's found himself playing in a preliminary final, possibly a grand final, possibly a premier. Um, I love that story and I love that he's playing his part. He's not just getting a courtesy game because there's no one else. I feel like he's earning his spot now. And, yeah, hats off to big Benny Brown. Yes, there was doubt as left, right and centre when he first came into the side, but he's definitely cemented his spot and he's just playing how we thought he would play, um, to be honest. I reckon that's it for the Back Pocket Plugger podcast. Rog, uh, another another successful episode. Thank you, McDonald. I cannot wait to, to uh, sit here and chat with you after next week's game, but I'm very excited for the preliminary final and see those mighty Melbourne Demons march into the grand final. Two more games, D's. Two more games. Uh, we want to thank everyone who tuned in on iTunes and Spotify. We want to thank everyone who watched on YouTube. And we'll see you all next week to talk some more footy on the Back Pocket Plug Out podcast. Keep plugging those back pockets.